All right, getting into part two of chapter three. Here we are. And the topic that I wanted to discuss here is BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. It is an organic pesticide and it's used to treat the larval stages of plant pests. So this is especially useful for treating caterpillars and for treating flies or, you know, in the larval stage, they would be uh, maggots. This could also be things like uh, white flies or fungus gnats, anything that has a larval stage. However, I have certainly gotten the question before, well, wait a minute, if this affects caterpillars, then isn't this also going to affect butterflies? And that is absolutely the case. The BT is naturally derived from a bacteria, but that doesn't mean that it uh, discriminates against you know, good bugs and bad bugs, as they are sometimes called. Because caterpillars on uh, your vegetables, for example, and this would be, corn would be a great example, um, they are not considered to be beneficial, those are going to be pests either way, whether they're butterflies or caterpillars. So in general, if you have a butterfly garden, you wouldn't spray BT on that plant, okay, or on that meadow. Um, the BT is going to be toxic only on the leaf where it's been applied. If there's new growth, then that is not going to be uh, toxic anymore, okay? So that's also something to consider if you need to uh, treat your plants when they're indoors. If you later move them outdoors and the BT has dissipated, then it should be safe for butterflies at that point. Okay, another potentially controversial topic. Not everyone is fond of BT, um, but there are transgenic plant varieties. I mentioned corn. There's definitely BT corn and those can potentially decrease harm to no, non-target organisms since the plant is producing its own pesticide and makes its own BT toxin in this instance, um, then there's no overspray. So you're not gonna have any spray that's going to hit plants uh, that were not intended. And in that way, it could um, potentially be more environmentally friendly. Okay. Again, controversial. Okay, let's go ahead and get into the different medium and medium mixes. Okay, you should be aware that there are several traits that the medium needs to have in order for it to be useful for growing plants, okay? So for one thing, the, the medium needs to be firm and dense, okay? So this is, going to be so that the plant can become well anchored or the cutting can become well anchored and it doesn't just fall over. Um, it should also be already decomposed and it should be stable. So when we're looking at our compost, for example, the compost should already be decomposed. We don't want fresh compost that's going to be too hot. Or when we say too hot, we often mean that it has too high nitrogen um, and we should have a 20 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio once it's been decomposed. The material also needs to be easy to wet. So we've heard some complaints or, or aired them out a little bit about peat and rock wool, which can um, have channeling and they can be difficult to work with, especially once they've dried out completely. Usually when you get peat, it will be a little bit moist in the bag. Okay, so that makes sense because the, the medium is going to be where the roots get the water from, right, and the nutrients. So the medium has to be easy to wet. Okay, at the same time, the medium needs to be sufficiently porous in order to allow for drainage and for there to be uh, sufficient oxygen for the plant roots. The plant roots need oxygen. We're also expecting to receive our medium free from pests. So it may be uh, better if you have a completely sterile medium. 
for example, our perlite and our vermiculite are going to come to us as sterile products, right? However, then you're going to miss out on some of your beneficials like your mycorrhizae or other beneficial bacteria and microbes. So you may have to then go in and inoculate with those later. Okay, we want to have low salinity or low salt. And the material needs to be capable of being steam pasteurized or sterilized. Ideally, what we're looking for is for our material to be pasteurized. Uh, again, so we can kill most of the uh, detrimental microbes and most weed seeds, but it doesn't need to be completely dead or sterilized. Uh, so we have to have this stable material that when it's heated is not going to um, degrade further. Okay, that's so that the medium can be reused. Okay, the material also needs to have a good cation exchange capacity or ability to exchange nutrients with plants. So it should hold on to some nutrients if we look at things like perlite and sand, they have virtually no cation exchange capacity. So those things will be useful for uh, increasing the porosity and the drainage of the soil, but they don't hold on to fertilizer at all. Okay, so mineral soil is seldom used because it's too heavy. It's difficult to ship, and there are also concerns with pests and pathogens that would come from the ground. Okay, sand is often used as a propagation medium. Even though it is heavy, it's easy to sterilize and it has excellent drainage. So it'll often be included as a component of a propagation mix, maybe like with 30% sand. There's also sphagnum moss peat, which is the uh, preferred type or, or peat moss. The sphagnum moss may be uh, prohibitively expensive. And this is going to be made from um, bog material. All right. We worked in class with the coconut fiber or the cocoa core. This is useful because it has a, a high cation exchange capacity and a good water holding capacity. But in order to make sure that we have enough aeration, just like we would do with our, our peat mix, we would add in uh, perlite or vermiculite to um, decrease the density and increase the aeration of it. Okay, so here we have some examples of um, propagation medium. Um, and you can see probably a little bit easier in the book, the consistency of these different mixes. You can see here some packages of the Turb de Sphange or the Sphagnum peat moss. Excellent quality, but expensive. Um, we can see they also have a big soil bay here that's full of an azalea mix. And then uh, several hoppers that um, are used to fill propagation flats. Okay, so we have some examples like the uh, Cornell peat light mix. And you have a recipe here on page 96 for the uh, peat light mix C, which is gonna be a fine mix for germinating seeds. Uh, it's gonna consist of sphagnum peat moss, vermiculite, 42 grams of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, two tablespoons of superphosphate, and 10 tablespoons of dolomitic limestone. So you guys can take a closer look at that. This is something that you can purchase, but it's also useful to know the components in case you wanna make your own mix, you can save a little bit of money that way. Okay, um, liquid fertilizers are often convenient. They'll come with a, a good formulation. Sometimes you can get organic things like fish emulsion, but the liquid fertilizers are typically more expensive than the dry fertilizers. They're also more expensive to ship. 
Um, controlled release fertilizers are useful because you know they'll break down over a period of time. A good example of a nitrogen controlled release fertilizer is Osmocote. There are also some uh, new ones that have come out recently, like Beanstalk, which you might want to look into. So I mentioned that in our medium, we wanna make sure we have low salinity or low salt. And that's also important uh, in terms of our irrigation water as well. Usually we'll measure our total dissolved salts in parts per million. Okay, we also are concerned about the pH of our irrigation water. One thing that we wanna look out for is having uh, too high a pH. This can cause problems with um, rooting. There can also be some um, toxicity or salt burn. Usually when we have a high pH, it's because there is an accumulation of salts or of calcium. And if you guys remember, we pH'd our solution to 5.5 to 5.7. So for rooting, that's gonna be the pH where auxin is most active. Okay, um, we're also concerned about controlling humidity. I mentioned that too high of humidity can uh, enhance pathogen infection. So things like um, botrytis or powdery mildew are gonna be encouraged in a humid environment. However, in general, increase in humidity is also going to increase plant growth. Uh, we also wanna keep temperature in the correct range, and we might want to manipulate the intensity of the light or the duration of the light. So we could use supplemental photosynthetic lighting, things like uh, ceramic metal halides or CMH lights. These are going to add additional intensity. Um, and we could also use photoperiodic lighting, for example, high pressure sodium lamps that are gonna be used to extend the day length or control the day length to encourage flowering. And they're also high intensity in order to uh, provide enough energy for flower and fruit production. All right, I also wanna mention for propagation, um, very important, uh, fluorescent lighting. Okay, so you may have seen the uh, fluorescent tubes that we have on the light carts. These are going to be things like your T5 or your T8 or T12 lamps. Okay, those are commonly used in propagation because they're low intensity and fairly low wattage. Um, and then we also have our light emitting diodes or LEDs. And these are especially helpful with energy efficiency because they produce a low amount of heat, which can decrease cooling costs. Those are considered energy efficient. Okay, and we can also use CO2 fertilization which is gonna be where you release the CO2 gas into the propagation house. And I believe that we talked last week about the uh, climate controls that can be used to regulate the CO2 uh, concentration in the air so that it's released up to a certain concentration. Okay, and here we have a reverse osmosis filtration system. This is going to be used for removing salts. This is a really high cost system to run and it also produces a large amount of waste in terms of wastewater. Um, and since plants require some nutrients, it can then require the user to come back in and give the plants minerals that you've just taken out of the water. However, if you have very sensitive plants that you're propagating, of course, we're talking about young plants here, reverse osmosis may be a good option for the grower. Okay, so for our accelerated growth technologies, we have this amazing flow chart here. Okay, so we're going to start out with genetically superior rooted propagules here. So these could be a tissue culture, seedling plugs, or our rooted liners. Remember the liners are about two to three inches tall. 
and we'll use our efficient container growing methods. So remember, we talked about things like um, having sufficient light intensity. We also talked about using the proper container and transplanting in a timely manner. Okay, we'll also use protective culture to pr protect the plant from the climate. So for example, glass houses or propagation uh, cases for the winter. And then for our climate controls or program growth controls, those are all going to be set within an optimum range. So including the light intensity and duration, the temperature, the nutrition, we talked about humidity and CO2. There may be plant growth regulators, especially if you're growing ornamentals, for example, cytokinins that are used to give the plant a more bushy growth habit which um, may also involve having more axillary buds, that's gonna mean more flowering sites as well. Okay, we talked about mycorrhizae and the beneficial soil microbes, at least scratch the surface of that, the different growing media, ensuring you know, that you have proper aeration and also cation exchange capacity to exchange those important nutrients. Um, and then we also want to, Make sure that we don't have uh, weeds or algae that are competing for nutrients in our containerized plants. And uh, we'll use integrated pest management to control the environment so that it's not a good environment for pests. Uh, we'll also use things like uh, scouting practices to watch out for pests and um, beneficial organisms as a preventative measure to prevent those pest management or those pest populations from getting out of control rather than aiming to eradicate them. Okay, so when we take all of this into account, we're gonna come out with large rooted cuttings, these large vigorous seedling plugs and TC plantlets that are ready for sale in months rather than years. Okay, following that, they're gonna be acclimated to natural conditions and planting. And then it seems like we're sort of starting the cycle again here, with uh, genetic selection, hybridization, and traditional breeding methods, propagating only those superior cultivars that have been selected, that have done the best, and then releasing to the public through nurseries. One of the best preventive measures that you can use is to use resistant cultivars. Cultivars that are known to be resistant to fungi on the leaves and foliage or fungi in the root zone that can cause damping off. You also want to be looking out for these pests and pathogens all the time. So even though most of the um, accelerated growth technologies are automated, you still want to do this uh, scouting practice. So chemical control is part of integrated pest management, but this is going to be sort of your last resort. Um, they talk a lot about fumigation in this chapter, but it's not something that's done as much in um, California, especially with the methyl bromine. Biological control would be the use of things like uh, persimilis mites. I like to call those the anti-mite um, to control things like spider mites and thrips. Um, you can also use beneficial fungi, such as uh, Bovaria bassiana. It's sold under the trade name Botanigard, and that can be used for root zone pests, such as root aphids. Okay, cultural control is going to be where we're controlling our environmental factors to create an environment that is not conducive to pest and pathogen pressure. Um, we can also do pre-planting treatments. So this is gonna be like our pasteurization or heat treatment of the media prior to planting. Okay, sanitation is gonna be, for example, where we are um, sanitizing and bleaching all of our tools, including you know, our shovels and our, our water lines. You guys have seen that we've sanitized our containers that we reuse. 
Okay. So here, they're pretty big on uh, methyl bromide in the first three panels here, extremely toxic. And they posted some warning signs here. Um, more relevant to us is gonna be the heat pasteurization. So they have here a whole cart full of soil that is being uh, pasteurized with the steam that's being piped through the system Mommy, here in panel E. And then you can see um, the whole system here on panel F. So this chart here is really useful to see at what temperature different things are killed off. Okay, so really useful. Some of the things that we're most worried about that can get us off to a just terrible start here are gonna be things like our water molds, botrytis gray mold, the nematodes and our pathogenic fungi like uh, fusarium. And you can see that most of those are going to be killed off uh, below 145 degrees. And this is Fahrenheit. So even a heat treatment of an indoor room at 140 degrees is going to have uh, quite a good effect for killing off things like powdery mildew or botrytis. Okay, once we get up to 160, we're killing off most of the uh, soil insects. And between 160 and 180, most of the weed seeds and all of the pathogenic bacteria, as well as most viruses are getting killed off as well. Okay, in order to kill off the resistant plant viruses, we need to go all the way up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And there are also some resistant weed seeds that require this uh, level of heat treatment in order to uh, no longer be viable, viable, excuse me. Okay. Oh, well, is this zero tall? So this zero tall is different than the zero tolerance by Ed Rosenthal that we used in class. This one is hydrogen dioxide. So this is for sanitation. Okay. Um, the benzylconium chloride that you see under green shield here is going to be the same benzylconium chloride that's used in many household and cosmetic products as an antibacterial. It's also used in hand sanitizer. So you guys might be uh, familiar with that. On C, we have agricultural bromine. Uh, both chlorine and bromine are halogens. So it's going to be you know, closely related to chlorine and its mo mode of action. Bromide is um, commonly used for sanitation. And of course, you guys know the chlorine bleach or sodium hypochlorite on D, which is chlorine. Okay, so this is glossed over a little bit earlier. Um, Post-propagation care. One of the important items here is hardening off of these tiny liner plants that have been just rooted. So of course we've been protecting our plants with um, a number of measures and they need to be exposed to increasing light intensity as they're moved outdoors and decreasing humidity. For root development, I wanted to show this off. And I know that there was one student in the class that posted something like this from the nursery. So I thought this was pretty cool that it was in the lecture as well. And we have a, a twisted root system. And this one is a little bit worse than the root circling that we saw in the previous lecture with the more herbaceous roots, because here we have a woody tree or shrub that has gotten spiraled roots. And these are gonna retain their shape because they're woody. So they're, they're not really going to change too much. The woody xylem and fibers are pretty much set and they're dead tissue. So they're not gonna change shape. And you can see a really nice example of this here in uh, panel B. So one of the most important things to avoid this is gonna be transplanting in a timely manner. Um, but also you guys have seen the example of the air root pruning and then the copper pruning uh, seed systems that can be used during propagation. Those will also help as well. 
Um, we have a couple of different examples of irrigation here. On the top, we have some overhead sprinklers. Then we have trickle or drip irrigation on the top right. On the two lower panels, this is really cool. There's a conveyor system that's passing these hanging baskets by um, the spigot, and it has a sensor, which is going to then automatically water each pot as it passes by. I actually thought this was just somebody holding a watering wand before I took a look at it, and I thought, wow, how convenient would that be? <laughs> 